And uh, our next speaker is Bob Ko from Rutgers University and director of uh, the NSF Scientific Center, MAC. Well, so while we're, we're getting uh, set up, uh, thanks to the two previous speakers for great talks, and thanks everybody for accommodating my schedule. I ran into traffic that I probably should have anticipated better uh, coming up from New Brunswick. Um, so I think I was here originally first on the agenda, partly to welcome you to this region you're all in. Um, I am the director of a project um, that Jorge is part of, the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub, uh, which is focused in this region, uh, spanning from Philadelphia through New Jersey to New York City. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And one of the things that we try to do um, is to do science that is useful in use. Now, I'm not a geomorphologist. Jorge is the only geomorphologist. We don't have an ecologist because we're really working mostly in the human environment. Um, so I'm going to walk you through, after I introduce Mach, a sort of case study thinking about sea level and coastal adaptation in human-dominated environments um, from a couple of different economic and decision analysis perspectives uh, and talking about sea level rise as well. So first, um, to introduce you to Mach, um, as I said, we're a collaboration of 13 institutions led out of Rutgers, New Brunswick. Um, we're funded as part of the NSF Coastlines and, and People's um, Hub Network, and we have four goals. Our first is to do science that is useful and used, in particular to facilitate flexible, equitable, and robust long-term planning to manage coastal climate risk in this region that we're sitting in. Well, at the same time, and this is how we're distinct from the uh, climate services uh, collaboration like uh, uh, NOAA research, also due to fundamental research that advances the understanding of how changing coastal climate hazards and landforms interact with human decisions at scales ranging from households and municipalities to markets and policy. Third, uh, you know, we are a collaboration where a lot of the work is done by graduate students and postdocs. Um, and other early career staff. And so we also have a goal in the course of doing all this to train the next generation of leaders in transdisciplinary climate research and engagement. And as we all do all of this, we bring to our work an attitude of self-reflection and sort of viewing our, the project itself as an experiment to try to understand how to build sustainable academic stakeholder partnerships uh, that advance climate action in coastal urban mega regions in a manner that is generalizable beyond our region. So this is showing you our, our current study areas. Um, so we have sort of the deepest co-production partnerships right now with our colleagues in the city of Philadelphia um, and their chief resilience officer. Um, we also have a variety of engagement sort of across the river from Philadelphia and Camden County, um, working with a number of other um, research groups in our region, um, we started engaging with the U.S. Army Corps around the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. So that green area is the study area um, for the HATS project. And you know, that sort of just released a draft. And then they realized they needed a lot more input from both researchers and the community. So that's sort of now another four years or so they expect for that project. Um, and then our team also has leveraged sort of separately funded projects um, over in Tom's River on the coast here and in Manville. Um, an area that's been subjected to a lot of um, repetitive flooding um, and has some interesting uh, policy challenges and policy experiments going on there. So out of our co-production process, uh, we've sort of centered ourselves around six research focus areas. So one, uh, the one probably most familiar to those of you here is coastal climate risk. So that's looking at sea level rise, which is where my expertise sits, at tropical cyclones and extratropical cyclones, at geomorphology, um, including both barrier island type work, which I'm sure you've heard Tori talk about at some point, um, and sort of dredging in the Delaware River. Um, but by risk, we, like the IPCC, don't just mean hazard, we mean exposure and vulnerability. So where are the people, where are the, where are the buildings, how do those evolve over time? Um, so that's, that's area one. Next area focuses on interrelated housing, mortgage, and insurance markets. So how do those markets respond to climate risk and to climate adaptation? The third area is on municipal finances. Um, you know, in New Jersey in particular, uh, a lot of key levers are in the hands of the 500-some municipalities uh, that we have in the state whose, whose municipal uh, finances can be 
quite affected uh, by hazards and by the needs to adapt to hazards. We also have a focus on equity and adaptation strategy design, um, a focus on household decision making. So how do individuals, particularly individuals in less resourced areas, make decisions about whether to adapt in place or to relocate out of a threatened community and a research focus area that again is sort of our self-reflective research focus area on trans transdisciplinary research and co-production. Um, so in the rest of my talk, I know you guys are all model oriented folks, so I wanted to do a sort of model angle on a couple of our focus areas, um, coastal climate risk and adaptation strategy design. Um, and for this, I'm going to draw upon work that's not only part of MOC, but also part of the NASA sea level change team um, and the climate impact lab, uh, which are the collaborations I'm involved with. Um, so one of the things uh, we spent the last several years developing, the framework for assessing changes to sea level, um, this builds upon work that we've been doing at Rutgers for a decade or more on probabilistic sea level rise projections um, and builds and was used in an early stage for the IPCC six assessments report. So probably many of you have encountered output of facts uh, before and, and the, the model framework is finally published. But our goal with facts was started with the recognition that this is an area that sea level rise projections, in particular ice sheet responses are an area of deep uncertainty so we need a framework for modeling it that is designed to produce multiple alternative probability distributions that reflect the fact that experts do not agree on how to model in particular the responses of ice sheets um, to, 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 to warming conditions and that those differences and those areas of disagreement can nonetheless be important for decision making. Um, so FACTS um, is a framework that was built using modern software engineering best practices, so not the stuff I sort of originally did in myself, the little MATLAB code on my computer, but well-designed code, to facilitate the, the assessment of deep or structural uncertainty and sea level rise projections, not just in the global mean, but also at a regional scale or scale level and also factoring into account extreme sea level changes. So one of the things that emerges from these sorts of analysis is that different modeling approaches yield different probability distributions for future sea level change, particularly in higher emission scenarios. Um, so this is one illustration of this. So over here on the left, um, we see uh, projections under SSP 1 2.6, so a low emission scenario. On the right, SSP 5 8.5, very high emissions. And each of those curves represents a set of facts, probabilistic projections with different ways of modeling the ice sheet response. Um, so the two darker curves represent what in the IPCC we regarded as sort of the processes in which there is at least medium confidence. So there's a medium level of agreement among different studies, there's a medium degree of evidence. Um, and so when we report out likely ranges in the IPCC, that's where those are drawn from. But at the same time, these processes that are on the cutting edge of the science where there's a lot of disagreement, again, still can be decision relevant. So we also include approaches um, for, for looking at that. Um, so a couple of conclusions from that. So one thing is, despite all that, through the middle of the century, sea level projections exhibit limited sensitivity to emissions and also to uh, ice sheet behaviors. So uh, likely global mean sea level rise of 15 to 30 centimeters, regardless of emissions reductions, meaning a increase of about 20 to 30 times in, sea in extreme sea levels uh, that were once a century in the recent past by 2050. But beyond 2050, sea level rise is increasingly sensitive to climate outcomes. This is a different way of looking at this than we did in, in AR6. So in each of these plots, uh, we're looking with across emission scenarios with end of the century warming level on the x-axis, two different alternative probability distributions, so a medium confidence one on the left, a low confidence one on the right. So what we find in the medium confidence workflow, you're looking like 40 to 70 centimeters of sea level rise uh, likely range by the end of the century in a two degree world. Bump that up to a little bit at the high end, maybe 90 centimeters if you factor into account ice sheet instabilities. But then if you're looking at like a four degree world, you go from 60 centimeters to a meter uh, in the medium confidence projection, but those low confidence projections can uh, boost that up to about 1.6 meters or so. Um, and so many of you, hopefully, if you work on related stuff, have encountered this, but that's all global mean numbers. You can go and look at the regional numbers underlying the IPCC reports here. So then in the last bit of my talk, I want to talk about the human side, the trade-off side, um, right? So from the built environment perspective, well, what are our adaptation options? We can accommodate occasional flooding 
for instance, through housing elevation. We can build hard protective structures. Um, this is a schematic of the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project in Manhattan. And we can relocate to higher ground. So this is an example of one of the buyouts that was done in Staten Island after Hurricane Sandy. So at a global scale, um, you know, one of the things you can just ask is from sort of a benefit cost analysis perspective, where are protection oriented strategies more advantageous versus relocation um, uh, oriented strategies? So in this model, you know, we take both physical variables like the topography, the extreme sea level, the sea level rise projections, and socioeconomic projections and current conditions with respect to population, GDP, physical capital, and construction costs, and look for where relatively simple-minded benefit cost analysis tells us protection to a given return period versus retreat to a given return period versus just moving out when the waters come in is the benefit cost optimal solution. Um, and from this sort of analysis, we find that about 80% of the global population is concentrated in areas where protection is identified as optimal by this approach. Um, you can see that in the top plot. Um, but much of the coastal area itself, the less dense coastal areas, are, are areas where proactive retreat um, often to the 10-year uh, return period is, is, is um, uh, optimal. And one other source, uh, uh, outcome of this sort of analysis, so here we're looking at annual costs in 2100 and trillions of dollars versus different levels of sea level rise in 2100. Uh, so with one meter of sea level rise, we get about a $500 billion a year cost, um, net cost uh, with optimal adaptation. But if we don't have planned adaptation at all, it's just reactive, so that goes up about an order of a magnitude to about $5 trillion and becomes one of the costlier impacts of, of climate change. Um, $500 billion is small relative to, say, human health effects. $5 trillion a year is not. Um, so zooming in to our region, uh, you know, you can see, well, Manhattan, uh, for instance, uh, benefit cost optimal to be pretty protective. Uh, Monmouth County out here, uh, I guess we're not out here. Monmouth County out, out, out um, uh, towards the shore, relatively near us, protect a one in a hundred year level. And then areas like Long Beach Island, even this relatively simplistic model tells you that that's not really a good area for protection. Um, and you have to think about relocation uh, to uh, one in 10 year return period. Now, that's a super simplified decision-making process, right? There's, it imagines there's like one person with perfect knowledge who has to make the decision for an entire coastal segment, and that's not realistic, and we don't have perfect knowledge. I just spent a bunch of time talking to you about uncertainty. So another approach to looking at this, um, this is a study led by Kairu Feng, who's a recently uh, uh, departed postdoc at Princeton uh, within MOC, uh, uses uh, reinforcement learning to map out adaptive responses to sea level rise. So not trying to pre-program a single metric in advance, but learn as we learn more about sea level rise and adjust appropriately. So his study takes synthetic tropical cyclones, it takes sea level rise projections, it takes FEMA cost data on um, different um, uh, projective structure approaches, and it takes New York City um, data on where the buildings are and where the topography is, and demonstrates with different trade-off algorithms from a static optimization where you have to come up with a decision now to the reinforcement learning approach, which is sort of the most dynamic and adaptive approach, what a cost-minimizing adaptation strategy would be. So in his like, most refined and adaptive uh, um, strategy, you know, it comes up with some combination of protection, accommodation, and retreat, where the height of the protective structure um, the elevation in the accommodation zone and the location of the accommodate retreat boundary evolve over time. And you can see across different sea level rise futures um, here where those distributions of those boundaries go. Um, and one of the key findings of this result is that you can show very clearly how adaptive decision making where you don't have to program things in advance is much better in terms of cutting off fat tails of damages um, than more restrictive approaches. Um, so this is showing you uh, exceedance probabilities in percent. So one per, this is 1%, this is 0.1%. So these are pretty far into the tail in terms of annual damages. Um, so if you take a static approach, let's say you're a regulatory agency, you look at the 2100 uh, public uh, 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 projections and you say, okay, we're gonna use this column for all 
for all um, decision making, um, then you end up with about a 1% chance per year of a $4 billion loss in Manhattan. Uh, and, and you can see the tail fattens out at lower probabilities. Whereas the adaptive approach reflected by reinforcement learning uh, reduces that to about 1.2 billion. And under a high emission scenario, those numbers shift to about 5 billion and 2 billion, and you've got a really fat tail if you're not adaptive. But this is still a really simplified representation of how decisions are actually made. Um, and so I want to conclude just with one point that, that economic models assume away a lot of complexities in the real world. And human have, humans have complex decision-making processes and many values at stake that are not captured in a simple, simple efficiency analysis. Um, so this is a, a result from an uh, interview-based study done by Laura Geronimo, who just defended her PhD at Rutgers, looking at preferences among individuals in Tom's River in the, in the, on the Barrier Island Park called Hurtley Beach, um, between leave-oriented strategies and stay-oriented strategies, showing that this breaks down you know, not upon a cost-effective metric necessarily, but on a communitarian or egalitarian worldview on the one hand versus an individualistic or hierarchical worldview on the other. So when we come to the conclusion, well, there's really no app for that. Like, the models are great, but scientists and models alone can't find optimal solutions to real-world planning problems characterized by deep uncertainty, particularly when there's value conflicts at strength. And so you need to invest in the people who do that translational work, which is one of the things we've really been focusing on, Mock, right? Think self-consciously having stakeholder engagement experts has a core part of the team and really the most important core infrastructure, much more than uh, any particular modeling set or anything that an individual researcher brings. Um, so thanks. Hi, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. What's the interface look like between the work you're doing and actual policy, whether it's through building codes or through municipal policies? So it, it, it depends upon the question. Um, so this is a, the, the I, I can give you multiple case study answers versus what my systemic thinking. Case study answers, well, um, you know, the very simple example, the, the state DP just put out um, its resilience draft rules, and those drew very heavily on the sea level and uh, a science set that we did at Rutgers. So sometimes there's a very clear pathway. In Philadelphia, you know, what we've engaged in with the city there is a two and a half year discussion that's helped us refine the research questions. Um, that at the same time, they have been figuring, you know, it, they didn't come into this with a clearly defined process, right? Now they have a process for generating a resilience plan for the city, or at least an assessment and vulnerability assessment. And that's sort of happening in parallel. Um, the way we, we think about it is that there's sort of two levels of responsiveness to stakeholders and decision makers, right? So we have our team of stakeholder engagement experts who maintain our relationships with our partners. And as you probably know, oftentimes policy uh, makers don't know they need something until they need it yesterday. And so one of the roles of those stakeholder engagement specialists is make sure we're responsive on those timescales. But we are not simply a climate services agency, right? We're an NSF funded project where our work is done by graduate students and postdocs. And they, you know, it takes a year or two or three for a graduate student or postdoc to do research. And we can't just keep um, uh, shifting all the time. So we also have this model where we learn from our work with the stakeholder engagement experts what would be useful. And then we have our graduate students and postdocs undertake projects that we know are in theory useful, but in the expectation those decisions will come back again. Um, so we have to respond on sort of two, spe two speeds, and oftentimes a response on the fast speed is, well, what is the current state of knowledge? Because that's what you, you know, the partners need to know, and so we're trying to work on both speeds. Um, and that's, I think, it's sort of the distinctive of, of this approach versus, say, a pure climate services or a pure, pure research-oriented approach. Um, thank you for the talk. I had two questions. Um, one was in interest to the cost. I love the fact that you have a cost uh, breakdowns across different markets, across different impacts. 
Can you tell us a little bit about how you calculated individual cost versus cost to governments versus cost to agencies? The reason I'm asking this question is because as it is happening right now, there are insurance companies leaving states right now and individuals cannot afford insurances yeah. so they're choosing to not have insurance on their houses. It's also a very interesting strategy right now because when we say that uh, we are giving them like hey you should relocate there isn't really a relocation alternative that's given to them and neither is fair value market assessed because at that point in time their house is already earmarked as okay this is a property where you shouldn't be living so they will never really get the market value they should have gotten that if they had sold that house like a year or two before that right i mean so so i think in practice oftentimes it is pre-event um at, at least in new jersey with the blue acres it's pre-event yeah in some um, states it is yeah. yeah um but i think that's that's a really important question and a challenge with like the tradition, more traditional economic efficiency approaches, right? Mm -hmm. Is that they don't look at the distribution approaches. And so you'll notice several of the, of the research topic areas we have ongoing are very much distributionally focused, right? So there's a focus on equity. There's a focus on these two particular mechanisms of insurance and housing markets and municipal finances. Um, so I say, those are all important. We, we had Laura, um, so, um, this Laura, uh, did a st early study um, looking at Ortley Beach, which is in a community in Tom's River that was rebuilt um, after Hurricane Sandy, and trying to do um, not just an economic efficiency analysis of alternative paths that could have been taken, but also look at the distribution of costs between the federal government, the municipality, and, and households. Um, Ortley Beach actually came out really well out of the process. Like, the, you know, the, it, the economic efficiency of their outcome might not have been great, but the actual individuals who stuck around in the municipality turned out at least as good as before uh, uh, from, from that um, sort of historical analysis. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of problems with traditional economic framings is that they gloss over political economy. Um, so in the... Um, you know, so in the adaptive decision-making approach, one of the things we're working on now is say, okay, well, a lot of people are hesitant about adaptive decision-making approaches, like the planners who build this. And part of it is, I think, because they, they recognize intuitively that the political economy isn't being taken into account. Like, it's great to say, okay, it's much more responsive to respond, I mean, it's much more cost-effective to respond to new information as it comes in, but what if you don't believe that the budget will be there to respond to that? Uh, right? Well, how does that shift the balance between, well, doing the best you can now, given the uncertainties versus learning over time? I think so those are, I'm meandering a little bit around your topic, but there's a, it's a rich note, and I think it, the, polit the absence of political economy from a lot of traditional economic models has been a failing. Uh, and to meander even further, it's also why it took, in my mind, until 2022 to get climate legislation in the U.S. Um, you know, previous, the, the attempt in the Obama administration didn't factor political economy into account and was very much a, a sort of straight economic efficiency approach. Got it. Thank you. And uh, the very small question that might be in one of the other boxes that we didn't discuss today. Did, did we take into consideration the fact on what changes when a user uh, moves away from where they're going to school, where they're going for health services, where they're going for so, their jobs? So that's, times? yeah, so when you actually talk, to, right? So the household decision-making box there is really the very much going out and talking to people um, and understanding, well, what are their values? Uh, you know, how do they think about the problem? And so, you know, you know ideally all of these things come together uh, and sometimes the coming together is more qualitative than something that can fit in a model. But, but yeah, that's, that's definitely why it's important to talk to people. Uh, just a quick question. Um, this last part of your talk made me start thinking about the similarity to agile programming, you know, where you're trying to be more adaptive. Mm -hmm. It's been shown that projects that are agile, they're, they're more cost effective than trying to make the plan all in advance. So have you thought about that analogy between the two? I mean, it's an interesting analogy. Um, you know, when we're talking about protective structures, the people you're asking to be more agile are like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and so it's not, uh, you know, it, 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 it's not quite the same setting as a, as a, as a startup. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just in general, right, decision, we live in a world of deep uncertainty, decision making under deep uncertainty principles tell us if you can learn as you go along, you're likely to do better than if you try to stick to a plan that you set out five years ago.
Thank you for the talk, Bobby. It's an it's a exciting project. I was wondering, uh, many questions, but I'll, I'll condense. Um, are there uh, lessons learned from your work within MAC to communicate these results to residents? Because I've seen in some of the work we're doing in Southeast Texas that particularly sea level is kind of like a hidden hazard. People don't think about it as much. They see the rain, they see overbank rivers, yeah. but they don't necessarily think about sea level. And I was, and it's not that easy to go to a community and say, you gotta move, right? Mm -hmm. Or there's one and a half meters of, of sea level predicted. So I was wondering if you guys have come up with best approaches for communicating these results and whether you've encountered similar things that I've seen in the South. Yeah where people don't really think about sea level as much. So I can have, offer some related observations. I don't know they can offer you a solution. Um, so one, it just like, check that, like we sort of have two parallel paths of communication in our project, right? One is to stakeholder, like to, to organize to stakeholders. So like decision makers who have levers and the other is to communities on the grounds who are household decision making team. Um, you know, from that, yeah, we agree. Like if you go to the folks in East Philly, Right, you're gonna like sea level rise is not the most imminent problem, right? And so, I mean, one thing is, well, you meet people where you're you're at. One of the things that's emerged from our discussion is housing affordability is an imminent problem. And so then you say, okay, well, what is the intersection of housing affordability and sea level rise, right? And so, you know, so 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 we started work. It's still very early to developing a community of practice of people involved in in housing and land use development who are interested in this intersection of um, affordability and sea level rise. That's not really getting at your question of communicating to stakeholders on the ground. Um, that, I think Laura's work is maybe a little more relevant there, but also, you know, when she went to Ortley Beach, um, this was framed in the sort of post, -San like, so everybody had gotten hit by Sandy, right? And so that, you know, these focusing events really shape people's discussion. So she just did this work, you know, did her interviews two years ago. So it's still, you know, that's two, 10 years after Sandy, it's still sort of very much in people's mind. Um, and all I can invite you to is like, you know, she got people who said, you know, who asked questions like, well, why are we still here? Uh, and you also have people who are very much focused on how do we, how do we protect this area? So I think it's, it's, I don't have a, I don't have a, a out of the box solution for you. I think, but I think it's um, important to address, and I think it's also important to recognize there are multiple channels. And telling people something should be important to them when you know the thing they actually want to know is how am I going to afford afford rent next month? It, it is something that need, like needs to be taken into account. You got to meet people with where their actual concerns are. Right, thank you. Thank you, Bob. And we have a break now, um, but don't go too far because we are going to meet in uh, this room at 11. Uh, Moira Selner is going gonna, is gonna to have a fun activity for us. So. Thank you.